today, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the first uh, Ohio Fish and Wildlife uh, presentation. Uh, we're being presented by the Ohio Fish and Wildlife Management Association, uh, the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative, and the Ohio Chapter of the Wildlife Society. Uh, is, like I said, this is the first one. Uh, we are hoping to do this about every other month, um, and we'll be putting up uh, future webinars at the following page. We also would like some help in planning upcoming webinars, so if you have ideas of what you would like to hear or see presented, or if you would like to present, uh, please contact me with my email on the screen. Uh, today's presentation um, is being presented by Matt Schumar. He is a research associate at the Ohio State University and project coordinator for the second Ohio Breeding Bird Atlas. Matt received his bachelor's degree in wildlife and fishery science from Penn State University with a minor in forest science. And then he went on to receive his master's degree in wildlife and fishery resources from West Virginia University. His research interests include avian ecology and conservation, landscape ecology, and particularly anthropogenetic effects on neotropical migrants. Um, before I hand this over to Matt, though, I'd like to let everybody know that uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to type into the chat, and Matt will answer them um, as he sees them. And then if you hold on to the end, uh, we do have a brief survey that we'd like you guys to take. So go ahead, Matt. All right, thanks. Um, can you hear me all right? Yep. Let's see, i got to jump to the first slide. Everybody gets to see a fast version backwards. All right. Thanks, Ken. Um, I'm glad to be able to start off the seminar series, and I look forward to uh, future presentations. Today we're going to be talking about monitoring bird populations using Atlas data and some of the things that we learned through work on the second Atlas of breeding birds here in Ohio. We all know that birds can be effective indicators of environmental conditions. Most species are very very visible or very vote and are easily picked up on surveys. If we take a look at some of the wording and the management goals or mission statements of various agencies, we see terms like active scientific based conservation and long term ecological sustainability. I'd like to pull out one of those in particular that's long term. And this shows up um, in most agencies' mission statements uh, or in their guidelines. And really, there's a need for long-term population data to monitor both sensitive and common species. If we take red-winged blackbird, for instance, we know it's still one of the most common birds in North America, um, easily found along any roadside ditch for the most part in Ohio. Yet, if we take a look at the breeding bird survey trend for the state, we can see a fairly consistent decline since the mid-1960s for the species. So using this long-term population data, we can really start to understand what bird populations are doing. So how do we acquire these long-term and broad-scale data? We do that through a number of monitoring programs. There's some that we're very familiar with that have been widely used, including the North American Breeding Bird Survey, bird count, um, various bird banding operations, as well as breeding bird analyses. An important point to make is that these are all, at least at some level, citizen science programs. So individuals are volunteering their time to go out and survey locations to contribute data to these projects. These volunteers are often, they're not always, uh, they have less formal training in the sciences. So they're not necessarily scientists, but they know a lot about the field. They're going out and they're surveying these locations and answering, to help answer research-driven questions. When we think about any large-scale program, particularly those that incorporate some level of citizen science, there's a gradient we can look at. Um, on the left here, I have more simplistic designs, which are typically associated with lower costs. As we move to more advanced methodology, that generally means an increase in cost. For a lot of these large programs, these aren't black and white. This is a gradient. So the trick is finding out where along this gradient is that sweet spot for your particular program. So where can we combine volunteers using some of the more simplistic 
methodology to get data at low cost and maybe coupling that with uh, maybe paid surveyors doing some more advanced things to get more bang for the most bang for our buck. And that's something that we really thought about hard with the Atlas in, in figuring out things that we can do. And that, that gradient or that scale is really shrinking as we progress, particularly with the use of internet and smartphone technology. Now, most people, a lot of people have smartphones. They're able to go out, navigate to their survey locations using GPS or Google Earth on their phones, collect survey information, and upload that directly to an online database with time-stamped geo-referenced metadata. There are apps now that interface with a lot of online databases. Some that we're familiar with are iNaturalist and eBird. eBird in particular is a program that's really taken off in recent years. And I think part of its success lies in the fact that it's really provided a product to birders that they've been able to capitalize on. We know that birders love to create lists, whether it's life lists, state lists, county lists. You come up with a list, and I bet a birder has it. And so by being able to capitalize on that, they've amassed a fairly large database for bird observations, and it's really well received right now. Some other programs that have done well, also run by Cornell, is the Great Backyard Bird Count. This is a four-day survey run every year in mid-February. This past year, the Great Backyard Bird Count went global for the first time. Over 35 million bird observations were reported during that weekend, covering approximately a third of the world's avian biodiversity from 100 countries. So really successful. We're really starting to talk about a lot of data here to work with. And although citizen science is perhaps becoming more accessible um, or more advanced, it's not really a new concept. At least as far back to the 1700s, we have a nice example here where Rob Marshall was recording the phenology of springtime events, including things like arrival dates of migrant birds, bud break dates, uh, flowers, etc. His family has continued that survey and now has an almost complete 300 year data set looking at, at this phenological information. So you can really start to see what happens with change over time. A program that's been used for a lot of research is the North American Breeding Bird Survey. This is a survey that's run once a year across routes all over North America. The map here on the left shows all in red all the locations of the survey routes. So you can see, for the most part, the conterminous United States is covered very well, uh, with many locations in Canada, and the program is now expanding into Mexico as well. We zoom into some of those areas, you can see that we get fairly decent coverage for this survey. I mean, it's, it's been a very successful program. All the routes in red on the right map uh, indicate active routes. So for the most part, getting most of Ohio. If we take a close look though, we start to see a few patterns and some gaps in coverage. Some of these gaps are associated with specific land cover types. You can see that we, we do have some missing information from urban areas, both in Cincinnati and Columbus. So perhaps in, uh, an urban bias there and we're also, uh, there's, a, there's a big chunk of land that's not surveyed in eastern Ohio where we have an interesting mix of agriculture and forest. So while these programs have done a lot, they are a roadside survey with limitations that, that don't get everywhere. Another citizen science program which perhaps has better coverage on a, at a small, smaller geographic extent um, is that of green bird analyses. So these are grid-based distribution surveys where volunteers are going out into each atlas block and recording basically everything they see for all the species they encounter, finding the highest level of breeding evidence, whether it's birds carrying nesting material, recently fledged young, observations like that. So this creates a fairly fine scale data set covering all the species in that geographic region. The concept of breeding bird analyses originated in the UK um, they're currently working on publishing their third national breeding bird atlas, as well as their second national wintering bird atlas. Um, I think that book is scheduled to come out this year. So they've had a, a really well, um, success, a successful program there in the UK and in many places in Europe. Here in the United States, breeding bird atlases began in the mid-1970s um, in the New England area, with Massachusetts and Vermont completing the first atlases. 
Currently, at least 43 states and eight Canadian provinces have either completed or initiated Atlas projects. So much of North America um, is sort of adopting the Breeding Bird Atlas program. There's a national interest and really global interest in repeating these ATLAS programs. So going back, repeating the survey, typically over a period of about 20 to 25 years, that gives us a data set where we can look at changes that occur over that temporal scale. This is a fairly new resource for ornithology in North America. I mentioned this, this has been ongoing in Europe for a while, but here in North America, uh, only a few places we really have these data to compare. Ontario, New York, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, and most recently Vermont, have all published their second atlas data. And as a result, we see an increase in peer-reviewed papers using green bird atlas data. And this is really important to quantify the impacts of environmental change and make informed conservation decisions. Um, and similar to the breeding bird survey, we're seeing a lot of interesting, innovative research using the data in which it perhaps wasn't intended for. Um, some of those looking at using atlas distribution data to estimate population size for endemic species in Namibia. And then recently, New York looked at their change in breeding bird distributions with respect to climate change. So a lot of really important research. Hopefully, we'll start to see atlas data used um, more frequently in the future. Ohio's first breeding bird atlas was conducted from 1982 to 1987. This was coordinated by the Ohio Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. That, the results in write-up were published by Bruce Peter, John, and Dan Rice in 1991 by the Ohio Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. Um, hopefully some of you have seen this book. It's now out of print, um, but we have an electronic copy of it on our website for anybody who's interested. So with the first Ohio Breeding Bird Atlas, and really most Breeding Bird Atlas, um, the published results come in the form of a book, and each species covered um, is given an account with a page uh, giving some natural history and comments on the observations and distribution, as well as a page looking at um, a distribution map um, with some tables and figures. And these are the results for chestnut cider warbler from the first atlas in Ohio. One important thing that I want to note here is that most projects in, with the first Ohio Greenwood Atlas focused only on distribution data. So there were no abundance data collected. So when we go back and repeat these atlas projects, we're really only able to make comments on change with respect to distribution. So are those boundaries changing? Are we seeing uh, you know, those blocks fill in or, or become more sparse? We can't make comments on abundance. So while the distribution, overall distribution has changed, you may have fewer birds in each of those blocks. So abundance becomes an important topic and something that we looked at for the second atlas. Ohio is among 15 states in North America conducting second breeding bird atlases. The field work for the project ran 2006 through 2011, representing approximately 25 year time period between each of those. The project was almost entirely funded by the Ohio Division of Wildlife. Um, they've been a huge support throughout this whole thing. Um, it's housed and operated here out of Ohio State University in the School of Environment and Natural Resources. And we also had some additional funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to work on our abundance surveys, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Throughout that period, when discussions for the house began in 2004, um, we had a full-time project staff. Paul Edwald, um, who recently moved to Cornell, um, is the principal investigator and has been the director throughout the program. I came on as a research associate in 2009, um, filling in after Aaron Boone left. And since 2011, we've had a full-time research aide helping with uh, data management and analysis. Um, Aaron Cashin, she's a former graduate student in the department. We were also fortunate to have a graduate student come onto the project. Um, she assisted with the final season of field work, but also um, she was using Atlas data for her graduate work, looking at the change in distribution of species with respect to changes in climate and cover. And I'll briefly talk about some of her work um, in a moment. 
We're also working with Andy Wilson from Gettysburg College. Andy was the lead editor and analyst on the recent Pennsylvania Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, our methodology was very similar, if not almost identical, to Pennsylvania. So Andy's really been helping us to push through this um, to get these results out. Most of those folks that I mentioned so far are, are working on the analyses and write-up. Um, we also have a small publication committee, and these folks are working on species account. Nathan Stricker and Jim McCormick, both from the Ohio Division of Wildlife. And then we have two PhD candidates, Dave Slager, who's a former grad student here and worked on the Atlas, and he's now at the University of Washington. And Molly McDermott, who's a doctoral candidate here in the School of Environment and Natural Resources. I would be remiss, though, if I did not mention all of the individuals who helped get this data. Um, so throughout a six-year period, we had about 30 paid field technicians, mostly working on our abundance surveys, and then we had around 1,000 volunteers who were contributing to the Atlas. There are a number of organizations whom I'd love to thank, I can't all list here. Um, importantly, we had the Ohio Ornithological Society, who's been instrumental throughout this program. They provided us with web space, a lot of resources, and um, helped some atlasers with some funding um, during the final years. Pennsylvania Breeding Bird Atlas, we've learned a lot from them. And uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology hosted the database um, throughout field work. So one of the main goals with any citizen science project, and, and here with the second atlas in Ohio, was to increase public interest and understanding of birds. The, the more we can engage the public, uh, the more effective our work is. So to do that, we, or to help with that, we gave over 100 presentations to group groups all over the state. And we did that through the uh, whole period of the atlas, not just in the beginning. We found that a single atlaser can really make a significant contribution to the data set. So by adding people every year, um, we were able to you know, really get great coverage across the state. So with the atlas, we'll be determining the status and distribution of all breeding birds within Ohio. And this is similar to the first atlas. And, and most breeding bird atlas projects. But we ramped up our F number of ways. First was our level of coverage. During the first atlas, they only surveyed randomly selected one in six blocks. So we have neighboring states, New York and Pennsylvania. They were able to survey all blocks with their volunteer base. Given a similar demographic here in Ohio, we felt that we could do the same. So we bumped that up to survey all of the land area of Ohio, moving from 764 blocks to 4,437. We did, however, place emphasis on what we call priority blocks. And these were the first blocks that, or the blocks that were surveyed during the first atlas. We wanted to make sure that we had the same level of effort so that we could make adequate comparisons of change over that time period. Here in Ohio and in most uh, eastern U.S. atlas projects, we define a block as one-sixth of a USGS topo quad, and that works out to about 10 square miles. So with this data, second atlas data now, we're able to evaluate changes in distribution between those periods. So are these range boundaries shifting, or are we seeing a contraction or a movement? And this is timely given concerns over environmental issues such as global climate change or changes in land cover and sprawl. Another uh, addition for the second atlas here in Ohio was adding bird abundance. We did that by, um, we wanted to conduct eight point counts in approximately half of blocks across the state. We did this by not using volunteers, but trained surveyors each year. It's a fairly rigorous protocol to estimate detectability based on methodology developed by Farnsworth et al. in 2002. So all individual birds were tracked during discrete time and distance bands. And this will give you an idea of what we're looking at with our coverage. So with breeding bird survey, there are a little less than 70 active routes within the state. So about 3,400 points. Those intersect 654, about 15% of blocks. We wanted to improve that coverage with our abundance surveys and also um, use some more advanced methodology. So 
this will give you an idea about the coverage and the resolution we're talking about. So over 14,000 points conducted in 43% of blocks. And these, these analyses are, that we're working with are really data hungry. So this really, what we conducted here in Ohio was a minimum um, needed for a lot of these species. Pennsylvania, I'm not really sure how they were able to do it. I think they're wizards. Um, but they conducted point counts in all blocks across their state. So this is really resource intensive. Um, we decided that we would attempt to do it in about half a blocks. So for the analyses, these are species specific models um, where we can incorporate uh, specific variable buffer for ha habitat covariates um, for each species. We're able to factor in time of day and seasonal corrections and also adjust for roadside biases and observer and spatial variation. Many of these species have very different um, natural history characteristics. We see willow flycatcher most active at dawn, and then we see a fairly typical decrease as the morning progresses. And then for seasonal effects, um, a lot of buntings and finches, they don't really become active until later in the year. So our surveys run from late May into the first week of July. You can see we have increased detection of indigo bunting um, late in the season. So we're factoring these in for all the species in our modeling. And for more information, um, you can see uh, Wilson et al., the Pennsylvania Breeding Bird Atlas, for a write-up of their analyses. The benefit of that is that we're able to create fairly precise statewide population estimates. This also creates a baseline data set to test for future population change. So second analysis, we're able to compare change in distribution between those two time periods. However, we're not able to discuss changes in population directly. Um, we are looking at using breeding bird survey trends to extrapolate our estimates to, to get estimates of change over that time period. We'll be creating abundance contour maps for these species. Um, like I mentioned, it's a fairly data hungry analysis. Um, we're looking, we're hoping to get somewhere around 75 species um, with full analyses. So somewhere between 50 and 100 um, will have some level of analysis um, using the abundance data. And as you would imagine, it works the best for uh, vocal passerines that um, are detected along road locations. From 2006 through 2011, we were able to get data for all house blocks, documenting around 200 breeding species. I think we had 217 species documented during the atlas. 197 of those were confirmed, so we had some direct evidence of nesting through uh, building nests or fledged young. And we did that through more than 1 million breeding bird observations, 70,000 effort hours, 400,000 auto miles, and 14,000 point counts. So if we revisit that scale, that I mentioned at, in the beginning of the project, there's a gradient from low cost, high cost, and we were trying to find some middle ground there. If we look at the demographics of, of that data, we can see that you know, over half, about two thirds are coming from volunteers. Between a third and a half of that data are coming directly from Atlas volunteers who are going out and surveying and uploading their observations either through our website or mailing in checklists. We also did some data mining through other citizen science programs and other uh, agency surveys. So we got data from eBird, Breeding Bird Survey, Project Nest Watch, Project Feeder Watch. Um, we also had data from the Ohio Division of Wildlife through some of their surveys. And then about a third of the data are coming from our paid field staff. Most of that data, about 25% of total observations, is coming from the point counts. And then we had a number of the remaining data come from general atlasing from staff. And they were going out and targeting um, areas with lower coverage. So, again, with, you, by using citizens or volunteers, you can try to push them out into areas as much as possible, but you still have places that really don't have many birders or aren't well covered. So, it's hard to motivate people to get out and survey those soybean and cornfields of western Ohio. So, we sent our paid field staff out to hit some of those areas. And then you get more information on the demographics if you start to look at the breakdown over years. 
And really what we've learned and what other Atlas projects have, have learned is that you really need that five to six year time period to get adequate coverage. Any less than that, and it's really hard to fill in the state, any more than that, and then you start to have issues where change is happening within your time period as opposed to trying to look at change between those time periods. So if we look at the first couple of years of uh, Atlas data, the bird observations are correlated, or the bird locations are highly correlated with birder locations. So we're seeing a lot of observations come from Columbus, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Toledo, um, some of the birding hotspots. That's just a fill in over time. And by year six, we were able to get fairly complete coverage for the entire state. So I'll briefly go over some of the preliminary results now. Um, as I mentioned, we're working on um, those analyses currently, and hopefully the book will be out next year. We see a number of patterns revealed from the Atlas data, particularly species recoveries. Some of these are quite obvious, and you perhaps don't need Atlas data to understand um, those recoveries, but it's really interesting to look at those maps. Here we have the results for bald eagle. Um, you can see by these few gray blocks um, up around in the Western Lake Erie Basin that um, they're fairly non-existent in Ohio during the first atlas. Um, but in the second atlas, we're finding them throughout the state. I think there's over 300 nests now. Um, and, and even in locations along Indiana, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania borders. The benefit of adding the resolution of all block data is you really get to see where some of those hot spots pop out. You can see that the Western Lake Erie Basin here is just a hotbed for bald eagles. We're getting nest confirmations in almost every block. The thing about an atlas is that you force observers to go out and survey places they wouldn't typically go to. So with the North American Atlas Committee and with other projects, there's always discussion about, do we need to do an atlas anymore? What is the benefit of it? Can we get this information passively through programs like eBird? Well, I would argue that, no, you can't necessarily get all that information because it isn't standardized and you're not forcing folks out to areas um, that they wouldn't normally go. Um, Birders love to go to places where they're going to see birds. They know they're going to get them. So they're going to go to McGee Marsh. They're going to go to Hawking Hills. They're going to go to these places. They know they can get interesting species time and time again. But by forcing people out all over Ohio, um, you may find some interesting discoveries. And during the Atlas, we found five new species that were not uh, documented as breeding in Ohio previously, including canvasback, common merganser, black neck stilt, Eurasian collar dove, and Mississippi kite. A few of these species I think we're going to start to see with increasing occurrence in Ohio, particularly common merganser and Eurasian collar dove. Mergansers are doing really well in northeastern Ohio, um, partly in effect because I, I, I think it's, it's probably because of nest boxes that volunteers are putting up and monitoring. So we're really seeing them in a number of locations. And Eurasian collar dove seems to be doing really well in Midwest and eastern states. Um, it's a hardy bird. Seems to be doing well over winter. Um, and I think one of the recent Canadian Atlas projects uh, recently confirmed Eurasian collar dove. So I think that's a species we're going to start to see more of in coming years. Along those same lines, um, we're seeing some species return to Ohio that previously nested here, but um, not in a significant amount of time. Um, common raven is, is one that I think we're going to perhaps see with increasing frequency. Um, we had one nest in eastern Ohio during the Atlas project, but in the final field season, we did have a number of observations from field staff um, in southeastern Ohio um, along the West Virginia border. So perhaps the species is moving in. Um, we've had a lot of forest maturation in the Ohio Hills, so um, we might see ravens with more frequency as well. I guess on every plus side, there's a downside. So we also see a number of population declines or range contractions. Here's another obvious one that a lot of people probably know really well. That's northern bobwhite. So you can see by all these blocks in yellow that the species was found pretty much statewide during the 80s. Um, and we've lost most of those locations. And when we take a look at all data, 
you can see that's really just two or three hot spots left in southwestern Ohio. So a lot of change in, in our land cover type um, and our agricultural practices that are probably affecting this species. Along those same lines, we have some similar patterns, but perhaps not as obvious. Kentucky warbler is a species that's typically associated with forest, but it really does well in those transitional areas. Um, during the first atlas, we had a number of observations in the Prairie Peninsula um, and up in northwestern Ohio. Here in the second atlas, we really find that it's contracted out of those areas, and it's almost exclusively found in the Ohio hills. We, all right, back to the good stuff. So we see a number of range expansions um, in the state. Some of these we might expect under scenarios such as global climate change. Others are presenting sort of an interesting picture, um, like the northern pool here. This is a species that's really become kind of the poster child for the atlas. Um, we're seeing a huge movement of parula into the state during the second atlas. Um, during the first atlas, they were typically associated with coniferous areas. Now we're seeing them use a lot of riparian deciduous areas. Many of these block observations were reported um, in large sycamore and silver maple trees along forested streams and rivers. So um, seeing a little bit of a behavioral switch there um, and it's becoming much more common in the state. When we take a look at all block data, we can really see that you know, it's doing well. We've got block conformations all the way up um, as far north as just below Lake Erie. So um, perhaps we'll be seeing by Alice 3, it'll occur throughout the entire state. We see a number of southern, what appear to be southern range expansions as well. So Yellow Valley Sapsucker, for instance, was just documented in two blocks in Ashtabula County during the first atlas. Now we're seeing it in most priority blocks in that small corner of northeastern Ohio. So this is still a small localized increase, but it shows up really well on the map. Um, so we're seeing a number of individuals. If we take a look at all block data, we can really see that there are a lot of blocks in that northeastern corner with yellow belly sapsucker and a lot of confirmations. Um, during the first atlas, Peter, John, and Rice estimated that there were potentially only 10 pairs nesting in the state annually. Um, and now we have blocks in that portion of the state with multiple pairs. So um, fairly large yet localized increase. Um, and as a result, the species has been downgraded from Ohio endangered to a species of special concern. Earlier I mentioned we had a graduate student working on the project. So she's looking at a lot of these distribution changes and with a relationship to changes in land cover and climate change. So specifically, she wanted to know are the distribution of Ohio breeding birds responding by moving their uh, boundaries or uh, center of occurrence. So she looked at the species that had enough data to see if they have northern or southern range limits in Ohio and if those have shifted over time. She looked at 17 species that met those criteria. Um, here in Ohio, she found that the climate signal or the relationship to climate change is weaker than expected um, over that 25 year period. However, land cover was very important, particularly forest and agricultural changes. Um, one thing to note, this is a little bit different than Zuckerberg found with the New York data. However, if we take a look at both the climate change, the mean temperature change, as well as land cover change, we see different patterns here in Ohio. Temperature change is not quite as extreme in Ohio as it was in New York. For the most part, um, it's, it's fairly medium. We've got some increases and some decreases. Um, it's particularly around borders around the state or at the edge of the state boundary where we have some of the largest increases. When we look at land cover change, I'm not sure how well this will show up on um, some of your screens, but there are some interesting patterns that pop out. We have a lot of development in northeastern Ohio, so a lot of suburban sprawl there. And around Columbus, it looks like we have ringworm or something here. So we see a large, dense pink circle around Columbus where there's been a lot of development. 
However, in the Ohio Hills, we see a lot more forest um, over that time period. So a lot of uh, forest regeneration and maturation in southeastern Ohio. Some of the more interesting or, or larger trends came from those southerly and northerly species both, um, mostly through change in occurrence. So species like blue grosbeak, black vulture, northern brula, and pine warbler were all more common during the second atlas, and these are typically southern um, associated species. And then uh, species like blue-headed vireo and cliff swallow, both of which we consider to be more northern breeders or higher elevation breeders, also became more common during the second atlas. So there is a mixed bag there. And this, her research, um, right now she's working on some manuscripts, but um, if you'd like a copy of her thesis, um, get in touch and be happy to send you that information. So we, we have a large data set to work with. We're just starting to scrape the surface in terms of analyses. Um, and we're hoping to make that data available soon so that more people can work with it. So we have over 1 million breeding bird observations. Currently, you can get the data uh, by request through our website. Uh, but next year, the book will come out. And we're currently collaborating with New York and Vermont on some threshold analyses. And we've talked with Andy from Pennsylvania about doing some larger regional scale modeling using those abundance data. Um, and hopefully next year we'll also uh, have an online database or mapping tool um, which you can visualize and, and extract some of this information. So again, I want to go back to this is primarily and in part a citizen science program. So our volunteers were contributing most of this data. Um, which has become very important for conservation decisions. We've already used the ATLAS data to look at the, speed, the listing status for a number of uh, songbirds in Ohio. And hopefully with the abundance data, that will be continued and we'll be able to better assess that change in 2030. Um, hopefully somebody wants to volunteer to run that ATLAS project. So we're working on the analyses in book now. Hopefully we'll have a manuscript to the publisher by the end of the year. Um, that's going well now, but um, it's keeping our hands busy. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and if you have any questions, or if you'd like to discuss Atlas data, uh, some of the things we did, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, you can either visit our website or email us or, or give me a call and I'd love to chat about it. That's all I have, thanks. everyone for attending and um, we welcome you to um, fill out a survey um, that will come up here on your screen so we can continue to provide you with um, quality webinars. Um, and if you have any questions um, for Matt, I'm sure he's willing to hang on the line here a little bit and answer any questions you might have um, by entering into um, your chat box. Um, otherwise, um, feel free to contact him there by email. Um, and we hope that you will um, join us for a future webinar. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Matt. All right, so we have a question on total cost. Um, that's something I'd have to pull together. Um, I, I don't have off the top of my head, but um, I, I would say it's probably over a million dollars. Something else I wanted to mention um, quickly, if you know of anyone that wanted to um, view the presentation but wasn't able to attend today, um, I would direct you to um, the OBCI website at obcinet.org, and um, there will be a link there for them to view the recorded webinar.
All right, we've got a question about habitat data from Ryan. All right, well, we have um, two different scales really to discuss there with habitat data. For our abundance surveys, we had all of our um, surveyors do some general uh, uh, habitat quantification at their point count location. So they were looking at different land cover types within um, a specific radius. So, so we do have some um, specific habitat data for each of the abundance survey locations. Um, but for our, our modeling and some of the other work that we're doing, we're using NLCD data, um, so the National Land Cover Database from 2006, um, for a lot of our modeling. All right, one last chance here. If anyone has any additional um, questions for Matt, um, I'll give you another minute here. Oh, looks like we got one. Uh, the Cornell database. So Cornell uh, offers a service for Atlas projects, um, and, and you can go to our website and, and navigate to the database that way. Uh, there are a number of states using the Cornell system right now, including, I believe, uh, Minnesota, West Virginia, Pennsylvania use that system as well. Um, it's a really nice database management and mapping. So it allows volunteers to enter their data directly through the website. Um, that gets automatically uploaded every 24 hours. Um, and there's a nice, really nice mapping system. So the, the Cornell system offers a lot for an Atlas project. Um, and I recommend anybody working on a, a program to consider them. All right, so uh, another question about funding the production and printing of the book. Um, that's coming from a variety of sources. Uh, the Ohio Division of Wildlife and Ohio State University are both contributing to that. We also did a number of programs to help subsidize the cost of the book. Um, I mean, these are, these are large, essentially textbook size um, works, uh, which can be quite expensive to produce. So we're hoping to bring the cost down for the general public to something manageable hopefully around $50 or so. Um, so we had a number of fundraising opportunities for that. Um, we ran a species sponsorship program, um, and all the sponsors will be recognized um, on, on that species account. Um, and that was able to generate around $15,000 um, to subsidize the cost of the book. So, um, but primarily from the Ohio Division of Wildlife and Ohio State University. Okay, well, um, if you have any additional questions, I um, would urge you to contact Matt, and um, his email address is, again, displayed here on the screen. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for attending, and we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Amanda.